First of all, I would like to thank all the uh, organizers of this uh, workshop and summer school. Um, I think it's a great event. So my talk is going to be about uh, image classification using uh, sparse coding. Um, so by the way, my name is Kai Yu. Uh, I used to work at uh, Silicon Valley in uh, AEC Labs, and just uh, a few months ago, uh, I joined Baidu. So in case uh, you guys never heard of this company, so uh, this is probably the second largest uh, search engine company in the world, and of course number one in the China Chinese market. Um, so talking about like an image search, so each day we re receive uh, about one billion uh, uh, search queries just for image search, right? So, um, so we pro process a lot of data, and uh, and I, I'm working as this uh, multimedia department. So we work on uh, image, video, uh, music, and uh, uh, voice recognition, voice search, right? So I think uh, this uh, whole su summer school is about deep learning. So deep learning is really a big, big topic in industry, right? In Microsoft, Google, uh, Baidu. So uh, we are expecting a big, big uh, improvement, right? For example, the acoustic model uh, in a speech recognition system, right? So we have seen evidence that actually this is going to be a, a, a the biggest thing in the last 10 years in the speech recognition. And uh, for image recognition and image search, uh, uh, actually recently we have seen uh, like similar level kind of progress, right? For example, uh, the record on the large scale image recognition like in uh, uh, ImageNet actually it's been uh, uh, continuously improved. Um, and uh, it's really a generating state of art performance by using deep model. So, um, I think this is a very exciting research topic. So, um, I think in my talk, uh, I, I will focus on image uh, classification, image recognition. So, I think incomplete vision or in machine learning uh, image recognition is one of the biggest topic, right? I mean, at least for incomplete vision, I think this is a kind of a mainstream topic. And if you look at those popular data set and uh, uh, how many papers are published each year on those benchmarks, right? Yeah. So, by the way, any, uh, I would like to ask, uh, uh, any of you uh, ever worked on at least one of this data set? Please raise your hand. Wow, a lot. Yes. Okay. So, yeah, it's great fun to, to work on those things. And the one trend that you can see is that uh, from like a like small scale data set, right, to, I mean, People are pushing the boundary to uh, work with uh, a larger and larger scale data set, like uh, millions, tens of, actually the, the ImageNet data set uh, has tens of millions uh, uh, images, and also uh, 10,000, over 10,000 uh, uh, categories. Nowadays, labeling data uh, is getting cheap, right? So previously, like uh, working on two classes or 20 classes is a big deal. But now you can actually, you know, uh, like Fei Fei, she told me uh, they spent uh, 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 about like uh, 100,000 US dollar to get uh, uh, 10 million images labeled. And you have uh, like uh, 10,000 classes. So, I mean, nowadays getting data is cheap, right? But then the question is, uh, how do we make use of those data, right? So large scale uh, training. Uh, and of very complex uh, machine learning system is uh, a really big deal nowadays. Okay, so this is a, like a traditional pipeline of, uh, of image uh, recognition or visual perception. So first, you have low level sensing, right? You get data from the pixels. And then um, you do some sort of pre-processing uh, like dynamic range, like uh, denoising, sort of things. And then uh, you do feature extraction. So typically you do this kind of a hand engineered or craft features. Um, and then do kind of feature selection. So and in the end, you do classification, this kind of a high level, uh, semantic level inference. Right. So 
if you look at most of the machine learning efforts spent like in the last 20 years or so, right? So most of the efforts actually uh, is about on the last step, the very last step, right? Doing a classification, right? Um, but from the engineering side, I would say most of the time, most of the efforts, actually, uh, in order to deliver a very good visual recognition system, you spend most of time on the feature engineering side, right? So classification side, actually, you, you just, uh, you can get some, I mean, uh, off-shelf uh, toolbox uh, to, to, to plug in, right? Um, but but the, the feature quality is most uh, critical for the accuracy, right? So if the feature is not good, no, no matter how good the, the classifier is, how strong the machine learning model is, uh, you cannot get a, a very good performance. Um, it's account for, it also accounts for most of the computation for, for, for the testing time, right? Because for example, you want to do real time uh, uh, video processing, real time image recognition, right? And it's critical to have a, a faster computation, right? But um, most of the computation you spend on the feature extraction and the feature representation side, right? Not, not on the recognition side, right? Um, but of course, it's most time consuming in the whole development cycle because you need to find, uh, you know, uh, very good features, right? So in the last 10 years, what's the biggest that you mentioned? Uh, arguably, uh, in you know, in computer vision, it's probably invention of uh, something like safety features, right? So nowadays it's getting so popular, right? So because uh, invention of a very powerful feature um, need a lot of insight and also engineering efforts, right? So I think this is, those are a bunch of uh, many uh, features invented by engineers, uh, you know, computer vision. Uh, experts in, uh, in the past, right? So I don't want to go through all the all the details. Like this one, okay. This is a safety feature, right? Um, so here, the story of uh, uh, of deep learning is about why don't we learn features from data, right? So um, we allow some flexibility on the modeling side, right? And then fit data to the model, right? And we hope the model can uh, automatically learn meaningful features from data, right? So this is uh, uh, essentially the purpose of uh, deep learning. So that's why I think, uh, you know, uh, in this uh, summer school, we call this deep learning and feature learning, right? Deep learning, deep model is the architecture, but the purpose, I think, um, uh, of the deep architecture is to learn meaningful features from data. So I think in this regard, uh, the deep learning, the architecture, and the purpose of the learning, which is the feature learning, I think they are equally important. And in particular, in this talk, I, I would go through to introduce uh, sparse coding methods and, uh, and just uh, um, convey the message sparse coding offers one effective way as a building block uh, to learn features, and it's a, also a building block to, 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 towards building more complex uh, uh, models, like deep models, right, uh, to, to learn meaningful features from image. And uh, we show evidence, actually, this is a very effective way to, to achieve state-of-art uh, image recognition um, performance. So this is the outline of, of my talk. Uh, supposed to gonna be like two hours, so the first, I'm gonna give some general introduction to sparse coding for image classification, and then um, try to provide some really personal perspective, uh, how to understand sparse coding, why sparse coding works uh, for image recognition, right? Um, then I'm gonna introduce cover um, hierarchical sparse coding. That means uh, you have sparse coding as a basic building block, how to develop uh, um, deep models. Right? And very briefly, I will just go over some of the uh, recent topics, um, but without too much details. Right? In the end, uh, provide some summary. So, 
So this is the really, really uh, popular paradigm for image recognition, which is the uh, so-called backwards representation. Um, and plus spatial pyramid uh, uh, feature representation to incorporate the spatial structure. Right? So the assumption is uh, um, simply for this image. So for this image, right, even though it's really structured, Right? It's a spatially you know, uh, structured, but if you capture some essential parts of the image and uh, ignore this, their spatial uh, structure, their spatial dependency, and just put them as kind of a bag of features, um, you still get some idea what the image is about. Right? So this is a very, very uh, simplified uh, assumption. But it turns out it works uh, extremely effective uh, for image uh, recognition. Right? So this is the so-called back of visual words representation. Uh, essentially, uh, what's behind is vector quantization coding. Later on, I will introduce more details about this. What is about the spatial pyramid? So since the completely uh, ignoring the spatial structure is not good, then uh, why don't we introduce sort of some uh, spatial information, right? So the idea is, okay, I look at the image at different scales, different locations, right? And, and in a certain scale, like this, this is a finer and finer scale, right? Let's say at this scale, right? Um, I'm not completely ignoring the spatial structure, right? Just in a larger region, in a, in a small region, within the region, I ignore the, the spatial uh, uh, structure, implement the, the back of words representation, right? But I still put into them, I compute this kind of back of words within each small block blocks, right? But implementing this, you still consider some level of uh, spatial dependency, right? And so this is the idea of spatial pyramid matching. Um, Essentially, it's a pulling the, the features in different scales and different locations. In the end, you get a powerful representation of images. And it works kind of uh, uh, very well. And uh, essentially, in the state of art uh, image classification systems, they all implemented uh, somewhat similar like this, right? Um, OK. So mathematically, let's, uh, let's just uh, go into the, a little bit more details about the pipeline of this using uh, back of words plus spatial pyramid matching uh, framework. Right? So this is the input image. Right? Then you extract a so-called dense sift, for example. So uh, here we call it dense because we, we extract the, the local features everywhere. Right? So it's like convolution. Right? Uh, we apply the same set of feature, uh, you know, as all the locations of the within one image, right? Then what we get is a set of uh, feature vectors, right? In this case, uh, uh, this is six feature, so then each feature vector is 128 dimension, right? Um, so in this case, you get a, a set of features uh, representation for the image, right? And then. Uh, I do vector quantization coding for every shift vector, right? Then what you get is a cluster indicator of the of the shift vector, right? So let's say if you have 1,000 uh, clusters, then this dimensionality is k, right? Then the cluster indicator vector is, uh, I mean, essentially all the elements of the vector is zero except the one uh, element, which is value one. Right, indicating which cluster uh, this vector uh, belongs to, right? So then you do spatial pooling, right? So you just do, for example, like average or weighted average of the of the cluster indicators, right? Uh, if it's average, then what you get is uh, is what is a, a histogram, right? So you get a histogram uh, of the of the histogram representation, right? In the end, you just fit this uh, representation into a classifier, right? You can see 
no matter how many vectors uh, you extracted from the image, after pulling, you get a single vector, right? And with a fixed length uh, feature representation, right? And then you just fit these features into the classifier. Right. And then if you look at uh, this kind of a processing pipeline, right? It's not so much uh, different from, um, let's say, convolutional neural net, right? Um, so this is kind of like a typical architecture of coding and pulling, right? So you can repeat this process uh, for several steps, right? So let's say this is an input image, right? You do some coding, vector organization coding, at all the locations, right? And then you do some sort of pulling, right? Like in the local region, neighborhood, you do the average of the codes, right? Then you get a set of uh, uh, feature maps, right? And then you treat this new obtained, newly obtained feature maps as kind of like a new input image and repeat the process, right? And then what you get is like a deep model, right? So the whole kind of intermediate steps, you can treat them as a feature extraction step, right? You extract the features in this way, and in the end, you do classification, right? Actually, uh, you can see uh, many state-of-art models of following similar architecture, like uh, uh, already mentioned the convolutional neural net, like uh, HMX, right? And also these back of words plus uh, spatial pyramid matching. Uh, they are all uh, similar in this sense. Even you look at like a safety feature itself, right? If you look at the details of the safety feature, itself is kind of like a coding plus a pooling, right? You have a, you compute the gradient at different locations, which is like a filtering, uh, like coding step, right? And then in the larger, in a, in a slightly larger lo local neighborhood, you uh, do some summarization, it's which is a pooling step. Right, so see if the feature itself is kind of like a coding and a pulling uh, step, right? And this actually makes sense because uh, uh, I think in the previous uh, talk we have seen actually uh, translation invariant, right? It's a, it, it's it, it's a big issue you need to handle, and also uh, a, a some certain degree of scale invariance and uh, deformation invariance, right? And uh, by doing this step, you can um, uh, handle um, uh, very well. Yeah. Well, uh, just following this architecture, uh, we, you might get some ideas about the better uh, to develop better methods, right? Uh, since we know coding, right, uh, play a very important step, so probably we can do better coding methods. Right uh, to to replace uh, vector quantization coding or better pooling methods. Right, probably average pooling is not good. Right, um, we have seen like max pooling uh, is actually much better than than average pooling. Right, uh, but there are also other better uh, possibilities. Right, um, but you need a better understanding about uh, what's behind coding, what's behind pooling. And uh, then you get some um, guiding principles to de develop better uh, methods, right? I think essentially coding here is nonlinear mapping uh, of the local features, right, into another feature space, right? And sparse coding is such a one example, uh, um, better than um, vector quantization coding, right? There are any there 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 are uh, other. Uh, better coding methods, uh, which is, uh, however, not covered uh, in my talk, but I think uh, from other speakers of this summer school, you learn a lot, like RBMs, autoencoders, right? Uh, there are also other alternative models to obtain better coding methods, right? And I will introduce, uh, later on I will discuss, uh, they are kind of like rela relationships, right? Okay, so, uh, what is sparse coding? So, I think um, sparse coding originally developed to explain earlier visual processing 
uh, you know, uh, mechanisms in 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 uh, in, uh, in brain, in the biological visual systems, right? Um, for example, they they find evidence like sparse coding actually lead the way to do like a edge detection, right? Um, but here I would not to go uh, into more details about the biological side, um, but just uh, let's first look at the mathematically what's the what's a, a one way of formulation for sparse coding, right? And so um, sparse coding can be understood as a unsupervised learning methods, right? So um, given a bunch of input uh, random samples like image patches, right? So this is the training data, you know, given a set of random patches. Then uh, uh, sparse coding first uh, learns a dictionary of, uh, of basis from, from this training data, right? Um, and then after learn those, ba those dictionary bases, and then you can do encoding, like for every, for each new data vector x, you can solve a mathematical programming problem uh, to find the sparse code as a new representation of x. And here I use the vector a, right, um, as a new representation of x. Actually, a, I use a because it stands for activations, like a sparse activations of the, of the model, right. So let's look at uh, a bit more details about the, the, the formulation. So um, those are the input images, input, input patches, right? And then the dictionary learning process is to, to solve a optimization um, uh, problem and you want to minimize this cost function, right? And this cost function uh, contains two parts. The first is the reconstruction part, right? You want to have some find some sparse some coefficients, right? As a weight, as a, to form a weighted um, weighted uh, combination of the bases to approximate the input data, right? And you want to minimize this turn. That means you want this reconstruction to be close enough to the original signal. Right, and then you put a the second term is a penalty term. It's a regularization term, which is uh, uh, encouraging sparsity of the coefficients. Right. So in this case, then for x i, um, then uh, it's obtained the, the the sparse coefficients a i right. But a i contains a lot of uh, uh, zero elements, right? Because of this this L one penalty, right? In this sense, the uh, x uh, leads to a sparse representation of the uh, of the original signal, right? And then the learning process is is uh, is a traditional alternating optimization. So first, suppose you start initially the model with some random guess of the of the dictionary, and then you fix this random guess and optimize this, this loss function uh, with respect to A only, right? This is a very standard L1 uh, regularization problem, L1, uh, L1 uh, regression problem. So this is a standard lasso uh, problem. And then in a second step, you fix those activations, those sparse activ activations, and then optimize those dictionary, right? This is uh, another uh, canonical convex QP problem, right? Uh, there are a lot of, uh, in the literature, you find a lot of uh, uh, methods to solve those things. And then you iterate these two steps, right? And in the end, you obtain uh, a set of uh, um, bases to form a dictionary, right? So this is the, the, the learning part. Right, and in the encoding part, then we just uh, uh, solve the first problem, which is uh, fix the dictionary, then optimize the activations to get the sparse representation of uh, of x. Right. And 
Here's a one example, right? Suppose uh, in the encoding phase, you already learned, you have learned uh, the dictionary. And then given the dictionary, you want to encode a new image patch, uh, which is X, right? Then you just uh, solve the same optimization problem, uh, but with fixed, with the, the dictionary fixed, right? And then you get a sparse uh, result for this vector A. Let's say this new input patch is like this, right? And suppose you have a dictionary already, and you solve the, the stuff, and then you just activate only the three bases, right, to, 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 to approximate this input uh, patch, right? Then uh, those are the, the coefficients, right? And in the end, you get a sparse representation of a whole vector, right? Most of the elements are zero, but only three of them are non-zero in this case. Right. And this is some further illustration. And you, from a set of random natural images, you sample random, random patches, right? And using those random patches, you can learn a dictionary like this, right? So you can see the dictionary is like a kind of filters, right? With uh, uh, different uh, frequency and different uh, uh, orientation, right? And then for this new image patch, then you solve the sparse coding uh, problem. Then you activate, the, the result activate only three bases, not all the bases, because the results are, are supposed to be sparse, right? Um, and then you use those three activated bases to form a linear combination to reconstruct the, the original image patch, right? In this case, you get the sparse representation, right? So this is the sparse, um, sparse coding, um, right? And then um, uh, sparse coding actually originally developed to understand the biological visual system, right? And later on, uh, people used sparse coding to as image processing, um, not for image classification. So uh, namely, those uh, like uh, image denoising, uh, image impainting, right? Uh, or image super resolution, right? Um, I think this uh, paper, Self-Taught Learning by Andrew Inns Group, is the first work to apply um, uh, sparse coding for image recognition. So uh, in a way to treat sparse coding as a uh, novel feature extraction method, right? And you get this new sparse representation of image patches and then do uh, classification, right? So they apply these methods on ImageNet, uh, on, uh, sorry, on Caltech 101 uh, benchmark. Uh, in this data set, you have uh, about probably uh, yeah, 9K, uh, 9,000 images, and you have one, uh, 101 uh, classes, right? Um, the, using the bag of words uh, feature presentation on SIFT uh, with uh, spatial pyramid and the linear SVM, this was the state of art result on this data set, 64%. Uh, and then, um, uh, apply sparse coding on the pixel level, on the raw patches, right? And then uh, do pooling. Uh, what you get is uh, uh, around 50% uh, accuracy. So, seem to be not so good, right? And then, in this work, um, uh, we apply sparse coding not on the original uh, pixel level image patches, but apply sparse coding on safety features, right? And suddenly you get a much better result. So the, 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 the idea is like for the, still actually you do like deep model, right? But the first two layers is kind of handcraft, hand engineered, right? It's produce safety features, right? Then on top of the safety features, uh, you replace the the vector quantization coding by sparse coding, and then do mass coding, uh, followed by, uh, in the end, you just use simple linear 
classifier, not the nonlinear classifier, right? And then, uh, then you can get a much better result, right? So it's a 73% uh, uh, accuracy. Um, in particular, you may notice actually uh, here uh, only simple linear, simple uh, linear classifier is used. Uh, versus a nonlinear classifier, more powerful, more complex uh, nonlinear classifier. And that means actually uh, by doing these methods, you obtain uh, much better features, right? And even using simpler classifiers, you can get a very good result. Right? And then let's do some a uh, little bit of summary to compare uh, several different uh, kind of methods for image classification, right? The um, first one is the kind of a traditional methods using dense sift, then vector quantization coding. Then that's this way you get this uh, kind of back of feature representation. Then followed by spatial pyramid matching. Uh, then uh, using nonlinear SVM to do the classification, you get a 64%, right? And then if you apply sparse coding directly on the raw raw um, patches, image patches, um, followed by like max pooling and using linear SVM, you get 50%. And then in a certain methods, you still use dense sift, like handcraft features, and then apply sparse coding followed by max pooling, and you apply linear SVM, you get a, a very good uh, result, right? So just by comparing uh, those three, um, different methods, uh, we might uh, learn some, some conclusion. So uh, first, uh, deep models are better, right? So if you compare the first one and the second one, right? And, or you compare this one and this one, right? Actually compare the second one and the third one, right? Uh, both methods use sparse coding and max pooling, right? But the third one is the sparse coding on on safety features, right? But the safety feature itself is a kind of, is a um, um, coding and a pooling step, right? So the third method is sort of like deep model, right? And then that means more layers of linearity uh, seem to give you some advantage, right? Then the second point is uh, if you compare the first one and the second one, no, f uh, sorry, compare the first one and, uh, and, and the last one, right? They apply on the same features, right? But different coding methods. Uh, then uh, you might draw the conclusion sparse coding is better than vector quantization coding. I would like to, um, to, to discuss um, why sparse coding is better. And can we, can we learn something from this? And if we could learn something, and then probably we can develop better methods, right? Um, by the way, um, any, any questions for the, for the first part? Apply sparse coding on, on the image uh, classification. So before going to the second, next. No question? All right. So um, in this part, I would like to first draw some connections to uh, other uh, deep learning building blocks like RBMs, uh, autoencoders. And um, next, I would like to, to, to sort of, I mean, there's no like uh, conclusive stuff here. Just uh, interesting to, to compare because sparse models are very uh, kind of hot topic in machine learning. And uh, you know, and uh, they're doing kind of like, for example, lasso type of things, right? And the sparse coding is also kind of sparse. And what's the connections? What's the difference, right? Um, and then uh, next, uh, I would like to uh, pay more ten attention to uh, what's the meaning of sparsity uh, in learning a sparse representation, right? And there might be some other reason, uh, like sparsity is preferred. So which is locality, right? And then uh, we develop, see if we can develop better methods uh, to, uh, for, to get sparse coding 
uh, methods. Um, better means uh, computationally and uh, uh, accuracy-wise. So uh, first, let's review this uh, classical sparse coding formulation, right? And uh, we can see here sparse coding formulation encourage the result, the coding to be sparse. And also the, the, the code is often higher dimensional than the original data, right? And you map the data X to a new feature space, right, which is often higher dimensional, but sparse, right? And then you can see this mapping function, right, which is what we call activation function from X from the original signal to the new feature space is a nonlinear implicit function for x, right? Because for every x, you can by solving this, you can get a, even though you don't know the 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 parametric form or a kind of explicit mapping function from x to a, but you know there's the implicit function, right? Which is the nonlinear function uh, mapping x to a, and there's also a reconstruction process. Right, which is given a, given the sparse coefficient, you can reconstruct the x, right, and so there's the activation function, there's the reconstruction function, right, and it's actually uh, see uh, illustrated here. So um, from from x, right, you implement a here in this case implicit implicit activation function, right, to get the codes which is the encoding process, right? And then given the activation, the sparse activations, the sparse codes, there is a reconstruction function, right? Which is to get approximation of the original data, right? So this is a decoding procedure, right? So noticing that, you can see the connections to the RBMs or autoencoders, right? Because uh, uh, both RBMs or and autoencoders, they uh, involve activation functions and reconstruction function. That means that they also have this uh, uh, this uh, decoding and encoding uh, procedure. Um, but one difference is uh, RBM and uh, autoencoders they have an explicit encoding function, so which is a direct mapping. You don't have to solve a optimization uh, process for the encoding, right? For sparse coding, you have X, you still need to solve a uh, L1 uh, regression optimization problem to get the sparse code, right? But for autoencoder or RBM, the mapping is uh, uh, feed forward, is uh, 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 direct, right? Um, and also RBM and autoencoders they are not necessary to enforce the sparsity on the on the on the codes a on the latent representation, right? Um, so, but if if you ask all the ask all the guys uh, who are working on a spar on autoencoder or IBMs, uh, actually, even though they don't explicitly put in their paper, um, they will tell you. Uh, sparsity constraint uh, often helps. Uh, so if you impose sparsity constraint on RBM or autoencoder, right, namely to encourage the latent representation to be sparse, right, you very often get a better result. And actually, uh, not only better result in terms of uh, uh, classification accuracy, but also in terms of the the, the learning process, the learning procedure converges faster, actually. Um, so actually there's some paper, right? Like uh, this paper. Um, so they, they, they implement this uh, sparse RBM, right? Like this is done by Stanford group. They, they actually in all of their representation, uh, implementations, they, they, they put a sparse constraint on the RBM. So in this case, actually, you might get a broader view of uh, sparse coding because uh, uh, since like a sparsity constraint is very useful stuff uh, to get a sparse representation, right? And then any feature mapping from X to A, 
right? Let's say this mapping is function f, then where a is sparse, and also often higher dimensional than original data, and fx is this line, uh, this mapping function is nonlinear, and there's a existence of reconstruction from the code to the original data, right? And if a kind of learning architecture uh, following those, you probably can see there are all kind of uh, uh, different versions of sparse coding, right? You just learn some, some, some latent representation of, of data, and uh, the representation is often higher dimensional and sparse, right? And it's kind of like general view of, uh, of sparse coding, right? Uh, therefore, I think the sparse RBM, sparse autoencoder, or uh, even the vector quantization itself is kind of like sparse coding, right? Um, so this is kind of a, a, some connections to other deep learning building blocks. Uh, I'm sure you have learned, uh, or uh, you, you're gonna learn a lot about uh, uh, other uh, things like uh, the RBMs and uh, and uh, autoencoders. Uh, in the next, then, um, what is connections about like sparse activations and sparse models, right? And we all know in machine learning community, sparse models are kind of a really big topic. Um, so let's say for a general function learning problem, so you want to learn a function, right? The function is uh, uh, from x to a, a mapping from x to a, right? Um, then what is sparse model? Sparse model's focus is uh, on the sparsity of the function parameters, right? So let's say you want to learn a, a re linear regression function, right? And here, uh, you want the, the sparse model imposes sparsity on the function parameters, on the model parameters, right? So the goal is feature selection, for example, here, in this case, right? Because once you learn a sparse representation of, of, of sparse uh, uh, model parameter w, right? Then what it, it means is all data set uh, all data select a common subset of features, right? So if you select like the first dimension or second dimension, the corresponding uh, uh, function weights, the function parameters are non-zero. That means you only select two dimensions uh, in the model, right? And that means you still get kind of like sparse uh, representation, kind of sparse representation for the data, but all the data share the same. Uh, non-zero dimensions, right? And then what is the sparse activation? So sparse activation is here, uh, the function's output are sparse, not the parameters are sparse, right? The example is sparse coding, right? So here is a coding function, then A is a sparse. But the goal is feature learning, right? The key difference is here, different data points actually activate different feature subsets, right? So here's a, a kind of a illustration. So if they say the function is like this, right? You select uh, the second and the fourth, uh, you know, uh, the, the second and fourth uh, parameters are non-sparse, right? And then if the input data point are the vectors like this, right? If you apply this sparse model, what you get is actually you simply ignore uh, most of the other dimensions, only select these two dimensions, right? This is kind of like a globally aligned sparse representation, right? Um, but sparse coding is different. Um, in this illustration, you can see if the data point are kind of like uh, uh, distributed in the original feature space like this way, and probably forming some kind of like similarity structure, right? Like these three data points, they are similar to each other. And there's one data point which is far away from those three data points, right? And then uh, sparse, um, a kind of uh, uh, ideal sparse coding result would, would end up with something like this. So um, you get different dimensions activated for different data point, right? Like in this data point, those two dimensions activated. For the second data point, 
you get like first and second dimensions activated, right? But they're different dimensions activated, right? And furthermore, uh, you hope to see some kind of a, this representation uh, to reflect some data structure here. Let's say those three data points in their sparse representation, they share some kind of like a common set of uh, uh, activated dimensions, right? And then the third data point, uh, the, the last data point, uh, activate totally different dimensions, right? So this somehow draw connections to a kind of like a, the, like a, the kernel trick, right? So the kernel trick means if you map the data into uh, some magic, a very high dimensional space, and then originally like a nonlinearly non-separable patterns uh, become linearly separable, right? So, so in this sense, actually, uh, sparse coding is kind of, uh, because of the sparsity, right, it's kind of encouraging uh, the separation of data, of the patterns, right? So it's just, this is just kind of intuition about uh, sparse, uh, sparse coding. There's another example. Let's say, okay, you have uh, some kind of, a, some more interesting structure about data, like uh, a manifold, right? So you have kind of like a, this kind of, uh, I mean, uh, kind of a continuous neighboring structure like this, right? So x, x2 is similar to x1, x, x3 is similar to x2, right? So on and so forth. So uh, in this case, if this is such a, such a data uh, distribution structure, then probably one ideal sparse coding result is like this, right? Actually, it's perfectly reflecting the neighboring uh, structure of data, right? Um, Again, there's no guarantee sparse coding will get a result like this, right? But somehow, by uh, uh, empirically, by enforcing sparsity constraint in uh, sparse coding, uh, indeed you get a result like this. Yeah, yeah, just empirically, right? So you can see, in this ideal case, then it's more informative in highlighting richer data structures, right? Like clusters or uh, manifold structures, right? All right. I think um, I would like to stop here, uh, and uh, then coming back from the lunch, uh, I will, um, you know, um, to go further to 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 provide probably one one uh, one way to look at sparsity, which is locality, and to de develop some alternative sparse coding methods, and provide some some experimental result on image classification. All right. Yeah. Thank you.